go, guys? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. And you just let us know if you feel any change in your breathing at all. It's hard to describe quickly, really, the last few years. It's so mind-blowing, really, that this only happened over a couple of days. Come on in, Catherine. Hi. When Nick got sick, we were all so shocked. I know. Yeah, they do know. Everybody knows now. That you could be a robust, healthy guy one minute and something can knock you down so quickly. Everyone's slowly wrapping their head around it. Your mum's pretty confused, yeah. but I guess it'll all become pretty clear yeah. after the surgery. I hadn't really understood how sick he was and that he was getting sicker. The doctors said he's got a very slim chance of making it through this. We had to make a decision that would change our lives forever. Hmm? The other option is not to go through with it and not stay with us. I really thought to myself, if there's any chance at all, Mick is the one who'll take that chance and fight. And he really did. I love you. Catherine, she's a special person. The doctors aren't here right now, but I'm going to write down your questions. I don't think anybody else would have had the love for somebody that she had for him. It's going to be pretty different. Oh, no. But we'll get, that we'll get through it, hey? I couldn't think of anything that compares to this, any other illness I'd ever heard of. Okay. A few minutes can be the difference between life and death. And the frightening thing is it can happen without anyone realising there's a big problem at all. One of the biggest things I think when I got out of hospital was I didn't really know what life was going to be like. What would I be able to do? It's a big thing to learn that I'm still the same person. Um, just I can't do the things I used to do, but life's still enjoyable. Like I still have my friends, got my family. We still do things together. We've adjusted to the way life is and it's just our life now. It's just a normal life. Mick and I met 11 years ago. We met through internet dating actually and Mick was the first person they matched me up with. I just felt really comfortable around her. She didn't mind me having a few beers, which was good. Go to watch the rugby or watch sport together, which is cricket. She's really into her cricket, so is her father, so that was good. We pretty much hit it off. I thought he was a really interesting guy. Very active, very fit. He was into scuba diving, cycling and tinkering with cars. Mick's background is as a fitter and turner. He went on to do mechanical engineering and I'm an architect and urban designer. Catherine and Mick had a fairly short courtship and in short order they were living together and Amelia came along very soon after. I describe them as a, I guess in lots of ways, a, a typical family. They had two kids. Mick was busy working, Catherine was busy working, they were doing the juggle. Just getting on with things, getting on with life. I do, Daddy. Yeah, yeah. Come back. In December 2018, we were coming to the end of a busy year. We're going to do this fast. Please. Leading up to Christmas, that, that 2018 Christmas, I had a lot of pain in my right glute. Um, and I put it down to cycling, because I used to do a lot of cycling. And the pain felt like a deep muscle pain, like I'd pulled a muscle. <laughs> Mick had a bit of a cold and we both had sore throats. We didn't think it was anything out of the ordinary at that stage. Christmas Day we had the family over and I remember being outside in the barbecue and I was just really hot and uncomfortable. It was a super busy day because we had the whole family here. None of the things that you normally do for muscle pain were really helping. So we didn't really know what to do about it. 
you know, it just seemed to um, be getting worse and worse. And then that night, the pain just became excruciating. I had to go to the emergency department. I couldn't see any other way of getting out of the pain. There weren't many staff on being Christmas night. It was pretty slow. A nurse came out to see him while, while he was waiting because he was in so much pain. He was actually moaning with pain. And the doctor, after examining Mick, said that he thought it was sciatica. They gave me some endone for the pain, which didn't really um, do anything for the pain. It was still pretty intense. And then I got discharged at about 7 a.m. on Boxing Day. He still couldn't sit comfortably and he couldn't walk properly. So it was surprising um, to me that, that he was sent home like that. The children had been given karaoke microphones as one of their Christmas presents and they made a dreadful noise. <laughs> I can remember Mick walking in the front door and saying, Tap, please take those things out in the backyard. I have to go and lie down. I have to go back to bed. And at that time I thought, he's not okay. And then I just went downhill from there and that's pretty much, um, I don't have many memories of that point on. Finally, I said, we've just got to go back to the hospital. On the drive back from the, the medical centre to the hospital, Mick said, I feel like I'm dying. The triage nurse saw him straight away. His blood pressure was low, his heart rate was high, and his breathing was starting to be shallow. The point that I realised things were getting really serious was when Mick was moved around from the emergency area into the resuscitation ward and all of a sudden there was an influx of people buzzing around him. They eventually made the decision that he needed to be transferred to a bigger hospital with an intensive care. I was totally stunned because the day before Mick had been at home cooking a roast for Christmas. Mick was transferred from Canterbury Hospital to Concord Hospital here in Sydney with a critical um, illness um, known as sepsis. Sepsis can happen from food poisoning, it can happen from viral infections, it can happen from anything at all. Sepsis is just the condition of the infection spreading throughout the body and affecting multiple organs. Mick's infection was taking hold very quickly, so we had to work fast because the infection was racing. His body was shutting down. So the intensive care unit had medications at doses which are virtually unheard of, and extraordinary concentrations of those basically pouring into him to provide him life support. At that stage, I was in the waiting room with my mum and Mick's dad, and we didn't know what was happening. And the next thing, the two people that took him in the ambulance, they came into the room, and the, the, the first words they said was, he's still hanging in there. It freaked me out. I was absolutely shattered when I seen him. You know, there was tubes out of everywhere. There was banks of machines around them. The doctors explained that um, the initial infection in Mick's muscles was strep A myositis. So strep A is just a very common bug. Uh, it would have started most likely with a throat infection. Somehow that had made it into Mick's bloodstream and had attacked his muscles, which was myositis. That, in turn, led to septic shock and multiple organ failure. He was fighting for his life at that stage. Your body starts to react to that infection. It actually starts to overreact. You start losing blood flow to your extremities. And then that actual part of your body starts to die off. 
Mick survived the first night, he beat the odds, but he was still unconscious and each day was a bit of a lottery. The doctors had said, it's only going to be something like 50% what we can do. The other 50% is going to be Mick. And a large part of that is going to be the family support, especially you, Catherine. She was there egging him on with every fibre of her being. I knew how much she loved him and how important it was to her that he live, you know. And here he was, he was still unconscious at this stage. I remember driving home, framing in my mind how I'd have the conversations with the kids about what was happening. Big changes were happening and um, they needed to be part of that. And they needed to understand really um, why I couldn't answer the question, is daddy gonna be all right? I, I just couldn't. At no point in time did we think it was hopeless. He kept on responding in small incremental amounts and he is such an incredibly fit and resilient person that his body wanted to fight. So using that fighting spirit, we never gave up. By New Year's Day, Mick had already had several surgeries to remove dead muscle. And the positive side was that on New Year's Day, he came out of his coma. It felt like a miracle. That is really, really so high. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to go to sleep. All right, so we'll say night night, Daddy. Night, night. <laughs> I remember waking up thinking, where am I? And then Catherine was there. Oh, I had no idea. And Catherine's like, oh, you're awake. <sighs> Dude, I had absolutely no idea what was happening at all. I was just thinking survival. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I just remember thinking all I've got to do is breathe. At one stage he had a tear down his cheek. <laughs> but yeah, he had a fair idea of what was going on. That's good. Very good, Michael. I just remember looking at my hands and just thinking, I, I can't see how this is going to work out. Like, they were completely black and withered. And then the wrist, yeah. The medical team started having conversations with us about the possibility of amputations. Mick's limbs were dying and he was using masses of energy to keep the limbs alive. We don't want to amputate. It's not what we're there for. Especially of a young, fit, healthy father with a family and a career behind him. But if he wants to survive, then we need to do very aggressive thing. After they explained that Mick would need to have both his arms and legs amputated, I was struggling to understand what that would mean and what kind of life he would have. I had a little bit of time of being really angry and resentful. I can still remember being at the park with the kids and looking at the other dads carrying their kids and playing, and I thought, Mick deserves that. It's not fair, and it isn't, but, you know, there's, there's really nothing to be gained from hanging on to that, and um, I'm not gonna be angry at every person that's got two legs. And as luck would have it, I came across a blog by Matthew Ames. When I was 39, my life changed. Starting as a sore throat, I had contracted a streptococcal infection that resulted in septic shock and the loss of all four of my limbs. They gave me about a 1% chance of getting through the surgery, but luckily I made it. I'm here today and uh, um, yeah, it's been quite a long process, but here I am. He lost all four limbs and he had a young family. He's also an engineer and the parallels were striking. 
And on his blog, he has pictures of himself with his children post amputations and he's smiling. And it was so important to me to see just that having been through that, um, he was happy. Every once in a while we get this, you know, out of the blue contact from somebody who is in a similar situation to me and basically I reached out to Catherine and ended up having a chat to her on the phone while Mick was still in intensive care. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of hard work, but I know you can do it. The amputations had to be done and so they said let's get it done and get on with it and stop this sickness that's in Mick's body, you know. So you understand about the, the different amputations and why it has to happen? Yeah. Okay. She was very much determined that her husband will survive this and it doesn't matter what the outcome is, it will be positive, he's got these kids and they love him and I was impressed but also scared because I have seen it many times before and sometimes it goes well but sometimes it doesn't. Mick had all four amputations done in one surgery, but the amputations turned out to be the easiest bit. Are you ready? Go, Mick. That's it, good job. They had to use Mick's remaining healthy skin as donor sites for harvesting new skin. That period was just difficult, so painful. Hello, Thomas and Amelia, it's Daddy. Looking forward to seeing you again on the weekend. Have a good day, bye-bye. I didn't leave ICU for probably five and a half, six months. Didn't move from that room unless I was going for a scan, a test or a surgery. He said it felt good. He said you can draw on his leg. We were just waiting for Mick to turn the corner. Oh, you can. It felt like months. I love Dad. Oh. There'd be one step forward, sometimes two steps back, a bit more recovery. <laughs> Do a heady, Mick. <laughs> You're doing this like a pro. Hello, feeling much better. I've just had a big surgery on my back for skin graft and the pain's much better. So everything's looking up for me. Once the back grafting got done, that's when I started to feel much, much, like, infinitely better. Like, day on day, I just felt myself getting stronger. Look <laughs> after yourself, Mick. Thank you very much. All the best. You are doing so well. See you in a couple of days. It was a very emotional day leaving Concord because I'd been given such great care there. I uh, wanted to make sure that they were all aware of how well they looked after me. Thanks, thanks, Sophie. Really appreciate it. It's just so thrilled you've done so well. It's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. It's fantastic. Without your help, I wouldn't have been here. So it's an exciting day. It's the first step of the next phase um, now. Yeah. Mick was just saying a moment ago he feels like he's just reached base camp. So now he's got to climb the mountain. Well done. Thank you. After eight months in hospital, it was a huge moment going through those doors. But of course, Mick then had to go straight on to a rehab hospital. OK, Mick, I'm going to get you to go down onto your left elbow and then we'll move on to rolls. OK. Rehab's a pretty intensive place. How many are we going to? Ten? Ten. Ten's enough. Ten's enough. <laughs> You have a choice. You can either focus on those things that you can't do or you can focus on the things that you can do. That's 10. That's 10. The entire purpose is just to get a little bit better every day. So in the morning I'd wake up, then into the wheelchair and then off to physio. So it's about the control, sort of passing it from one hand to another. Yeah, well done, that's good. I was still staying positive and then by the time December came around I was fit enough, physically fit enough, that I could come home. I've been trialling various prosthetics. I don't know what I'll end up using, but I'm sure I'll get the right one for me. Hey, Mick, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, and 
Look what I've got. <laughs> Excellent. That's pretty cool. I have regular conversations with Matthew. Yeah, it's pretty funny when I take it up to school because I'm like a rock star. It's a, a physical and emotional challenge for me and my family. And just knowing that Matthew's got through it and his family just gives us a lot of hope that we'll be the same. I took your lead on that one. <laughs> I mean, they say for an average amputation, it takes about two years for people to go through the whole process and find a new normal. Um, so given that we've got four limbs, it should take us eight years, I reckon. <laughs> but I think it probably took me about five. I'll just keep progressing till I get to those other things. And that's why I'm taking it at the moment. Have you done much with the Sepsis Foundation this year? Uh, yeah, it's been interesting. It's been really busy. Uh... Matthew's been talking to us about the awareness raising work he's been doing with the Sepsis Network, which is a group of doctors who really want to get the message out to the community and medical workers that sepsis can be prevented. You know, particularly with COVID, you know, yep. with a lot of people who get COVID actually pass away from sepsis. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's more than 55,000 cases in Australia every year, resulting in well over 7,000 deaths. Uh, actually causes more deaths than some of the common cancers that people have heard about, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and heart attack. So it's absolutely critical that we recognise sepsis, we diagnose it, and we start treatment within the first hour. The problem with sepsis is there is no definitive diagnostic test. The signs are things like rapid breathing, rapid heart rate, muscle aches and pains, shivering and shaking, mental confusion. With hindsight, knowing how quickly Mick deteriorated, um, those hours that he could have been in hospital from the time when he first went on Christmas night, I think would have been critical. And understanding how sepsis works and the treatment is simple with fluids and antibiotics. Um, if he'd have received that treatment straight away the first time he went to hospital, things could have been different. What is needed is training and a change in the mindset of people in the same way that we have changed our approach to heart attack and stroke. That is what will make a difference. The recognition and rapid treatment of sepsis has to be rolled out across the entire healthcare system. It's a very big problem in Australia and I wasn't aware of it until it happened to me. If you're not feeling well, you have to go and see a doctor because I was feeling unwell and it was a different type of unwell and I've never felt like that before. Go to an emergency department or go see a doctor straight away because the sooner you can get to it, the better off you'll be. Mick's come so far in a relatively short time. You know, we still have quite a few challenges but we have a way of working through them and um, I feel really positive about that. It's uh, been four years since I've got sick and I, I can't believe it that I'm actually going sailing today and I sail the boat solo. It's a beautiful spot in Sydney, right near the harbour and it's absolutely incredible I can go out and sail this boat all by myself. In the early days when Mick first came home from hospital and was adjusting to this new life, he was really missing the ability to get out on the water and take part in those kind of activities. And then through a family friend, I discovered Sailability. That's a volunteer group who take people with any disability sailing. I need assistance to get into the boat, but once I'm in the boat, I'm independent and I'm sailing the boat, which I never thought I'd be able to do. It's such an amazing feeling out here because I've got total independence of what I'm doing and it's just so enjoyable. I always felt pretty confident that he would find his way to a level of independence. Yeah. Mick has a lot of jobs in our family routine. He's usually the one to pick the kids up from school. Well, I know there were eight, sorry, so we got to sit wherever we were. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's great. Mick and the carer go together usually. Care is the one who drives. <laughs> Mick's learning, but we haven't yet got a vehicle that Mick can drive himself. 
he's the one who takes them to Taekwondo and to music and all of the things that they do in the afternoon. It really frees up Catherine to have a normal life, go to work and do things. And with the kids, they've just adjusted to this is the way I am, I'm in the wheelchair. I just see our family now as a normal family. There's a lot of parents out there with disabilities. I guess I can tell when Mick's having a down day when he's, you know, a bit more quiet than usual and maybe seems to be giving up on things a little more easily than usual. But those down days aren't very common. So does the whole school go to the assembly tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I might be able to make it, but I doubt it. I don't think we've fully adjusted, I don't know if we ever will, to this new norm. He's not independent and he needs someone with him pretty much all the time. I know he feels incredibly frustrated and sometimes overwhelmingly sad about what's happened. Anyone who's been through major trauma would have this and then it's just learning to accept these things and I've been given quite a few tools with psychologists of how to work through days. Beautifully clean table. State of mind has been something that's been a learning curve for all of us really, for Mick but also for me in our relationship and I'm getting better at reading where he's at and knowing um, the signs of, you know, when he might be having a hard time and, and, and how to help with that. It's definitely been a relief to Mick to find that he can still have fun doing things on the water or in the water. He had quite a long time of feeling really bored. First time I got in the pool, yeah, I was a bit nervous because you just don't know once you lose your arms and legs because you don't know how you're going to float. And you don't realise when you float how many muscles you use in your body to keep yourself upright or lying back flat on your back. Once I got the hang of swimming, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I started swimming, so hopefully one day I can get back into scuba diving and I'm working towards that goal. And hopefully in the next couple of months I'll be able to do it in a pool. It's the enjoyment of doing some exercise. Also, too, a bit of independence, actually doing something independently. So we're just going to run through signals again? Yep. Want to go up? Yeah, look up. Want to go down? Even point. Yeah, if there's... Can you show me a happy dance like you're having a ball? Come on, don't dance. a wriggle. <laughs> Mick found us. I had no idea he was a quadruple amputee. He had just messaged me to say he was interested in coming to the scuba gym to get back into diving and, uh, and then said, oh, by the way, I'm a quadruple amputee. Come, let's do it. <laughs> Scuba diving to me five years ago was a big part of my life. I didn't think I'd actually get to do it again. I think the way it's turned out in some ways is better than I feared, but there's still progress to make for Mick. Sometimes I feel I've made no progress because I still require a lot of help. But then when I reflect on it and look at the things I can do now, I think I've come a long way. So yeah, life's good. Thanks. That was outstanding. Wait, let me do it. There's a bit more depth in this pool, that's all. Awesome.